Ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to Big Evil's Lair. This is Jamie Harris and also Billy's Pit, the infamous Billy Minimal. What's going on, Bill? Jamie, how you doing? Good, good, good. Uh, it's like every month, Billy has awesome guests on Billy's Pit, and this month is no different. We have the legendary Dave Hoff from Westside Barbell, 275 Super Lifter. Dave, what's going on, man? Hey, buddy, what's up? Not much. Uh, okay, Bill, fire away, man. All right, Dave. Now, it, we, when you were 15 years old, you walk in the Westside Barbell and you see in the Vogel pools, and I don't know if Dave Tate, but I imagine it was the old crew, the you know, the crew of the of the yeah. videotapes. How was that walking in there as a young man like that? And uh, you know, I, t- tell us a little bit what you were thinking when you walked into the gym. Well, and, and like the first word is a humbling experience because like you walk in and you realize how much you really aren't. And like I said before, like. You know, you, I was used to training in commercial gyms and all these other, you know, hole-in-the-wall gyms. But you go to Westside Barbell, it's just like a, it's like a, it's like an awe that comes over you. Like, so I was scared, to be honest with you. It was a scary experience. Right. So that when I, cause actually, my, when I first went in there, they were shooting an actual Westside video. So me, not even doing anything, was thrown in a video. It was just, uh-huh. it's like you're here, get in it. It's like that's what you did. So, and then in the in the beginning of your training, or the uh, the guy at Westside that sort of took you under his wing, or you actually could say explain that he might have you might have taken him under his wing trying to get him back on the platform is Bob Coe. Tell us a little bit about how his he's influenced your training through the years and 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 how much he's meant to your career. Well, if he was the guy you know that that stuck beside me no matter what, he 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 like care he like cared about what I did. He didn't want to see me get hurt. You know, when you go to the West Side, you, you know, there's so much pressure to be the best. There's so much pressure to do big numbers. He pretty much took me away from that pressure and just said, we're going to build you up. I mean, the dude spent a lot of time on me. That just would, would show up to workouts, like just me and him. Just and He pretty much brought me from the bottom to the top. Right. Now, is Bob's an old school West Side guy, an original, so he, he came up under the old West Side template with, you know, really with, with no band or chains. He was there way before that. Did okay. he introduce those things slowly, or did he bring you up sort of the way he was brought up? No bands, no chain, no extra stimulus, or how did that, how did that go? Well, it, when you train at West Side, it's kind of like you do what the strongest guys do, and it's, cause it's like an ever... It's like an ever-changing process, but there's always like a basic guideline. And basically, what he, what, what Louie would do is Louie would be like, okay, this is what we do in the morning. He'd like have him do this. And so Bob would take it and be like, look, we're going to go, we're going to just water this down a little bit, and then we're going to start out. I would start with bands, chains. I did everything everybody else did from day one. It was just the intensity of the training wasn't as high. So that is what raised over the period of seven or eight years. Right. And now, when 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 Bob is is training you, how is the volume compared to like the morning crew? Does he? You, you know, your box squat. You said your box squat system is sort of the same as what the morning crew is doing. Did, was your assistance the same, or was that sort of tapered back? You know, given your age. Well, at first, like we like everybody kind of did the same thing in terms of assistance, but then like. As you as you grow as a power lifter, you you recognize what you as a lifter need, and then you start incorporating your own types of assistance work. And basically, what I started, I, w- I would just pretty much do bodybuilding movements. So, right, because I remember reading it in in the Powerlifting USA. Now, Lou has a lot of stuff in there that has, it, it, some of it needs to be taken with a grain of salt because Lou, you know, he he's incorporating a lot of training in one article but that training could be over a month oh so and it's hard to really unless you're at west side it's very difficult to really know exactly what's going on but lewis said about you that you really didn't do a lot of assistance work that you basically concentrate on the three big lifts and you're just you're just genetically very gifted and and your form is so good that you didn't need tons and tons and tons of assistance work is that do you you feel that that's true well i would say to it to an extent that's right like i mean when i first started like uh, you know, it's kind of like I would say my central nervous system wasn't up to par to handle those certain things. So, like, you know, like if I would push myself to a point and then a little bit past that, and then we'd shut it down. It was kind of like a, 
it was kind of like I never let myself get overtrained. I never felt beat down. Not to say I never felt beat down, but you get what I'm kind of saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Now, you, you squatted 1,000 at 19, which is the youngest man to ever squat 1,000 pounds. W- was this a goal of yours, or did this just come about as that was just a progression that happened? Well, it was kind of weird. Like, when like my, I go to my first meet, and like I was like, oh, I want to try and break a record. And I go there, I looked, and I looked, and I was like, well, you don't have very much. And then I broke those records, and then it was like, I just kind of kept, you know, I get one, and it's kind of like I walked up a step, but I'd look up to the next one, and the biggest one, I was like, well, I want to be the strongest teenager ever, you know, because when you're a kid, you know, you know, I always wanted to be that strong guy. So I was like, well, he's got it, and apparently it was, um, I believe it was Scott Weech. He squatted 1,000 when he was 20 years old in three months. And I was like, well, I guess that's what I want to do, so... I just kept working, and then, you know, 800 came, and 870, and then 900, and 960, and then uh, eventually, and then the thousands, it just came. It was kind of funny. It just kind of went. Yeah. Now, you, you, Lou said about you that you're one of the most consistent lifters to ever train at Westside, and, and from watching you at meets, I've seen you, I think I've seen you lift now at three meets in person. The thing that I'm so impressed with about you as a multiply guy especially, because a lot of times you see guys take bars out of the rack, they're shaking, you know, they're all over the place. I mean, they can get the weight because they're just bull strong, but you on every single movement that I ever see you do is you dominate the weights from start till end. You know, you take a, you take a bench out, you hold that bench at the top for at least, a, a, you know, a 1-1,000 one, one count, then you come down, you press it up, you hold it again before you rack. It's never sort of Dave's kind of just jamming the bar into the racks. Did this come apart? Was this... Tra- you know, something that you were trained at from a young age, or is this something that you developed on your own through the years? Well, it, this goes back to Bob Code, you know, looking out for me. He would never, like, when I was, when, like, from when I got there, when I was 15, 16, it was perfect form, perfect technique. We don't, we don't go any, we don't raise the weight until this looks perfect. It's like, I would never, I would never jump to a weight and have shitty form. It's just like, I wasn't allowed to do that. So, like, the only things that were instilled into me were positive, positive affirmations. Right, like, right. It was like all that was beat into me was it's got to be like this. You got to hold this. You, you know, because I train, I train in the gym how I'm going to train in the meet. You know, I don't, I don't change much. So, you know, it's all about what the judges think. So I try to, try to make it look pretty for them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you, I, w- I would say the multiply. You know, I thought for a while I thought it was that Jeremy Frey. I thought he was the. He was the guy who looked the best, but I think you've taken oh, over. I mean, I, your your form is just unbelievable on the on the. You know, you, it's total domination. Like I said, every weight looks the same. It's never, you know, Dave's you know, bench eight fifty, and then he goes to nine hundred. It looks like shit, but it, they, with Dave, it's everything looks good. So that's uh, I think that's pretty impressive. Um, let me ask you this: now, when you when you when you bench, <laughs> this is one of the things that I find the most amazing about watching you lift. I don't think I've ever seen, you know, you're a pretty lean, you're a 275, a light 275, and you're, you know, you don't have much of an abdominal wall. I mean, you can expand it, obviously, but when you lie down on that bench, I've been watching bench pressing for 30 years, and I've never seen anyone who can expand his belly up into the air the way you can. How how do you develop that type of a thing? Is that, again, just practice from the start? Dude, it's funny. I would say it's probably from going to the buffet. Me, (laughs) <laughs> he's, a, he's a guy in the gym. He'll, he'll, you know, we'll go to the buffet. He's like, hey man, looks like you had a baby. I'm like, I'm with child. You know, it's just like, dude, I just eating, I guess, man. And you know, I've always practiced, you know, my arts, and I've all, you know, you know, you know, you, you mess around in the gym, you know, and like should be a squat day, but you're laying down on the bench messing around. And I'd always just kind of like push my belly up as far as I could, and, and it all just kind of fell into place. I figured it out, and a light bulb clicked, and said, hey, if I can do this in a bench, sure, I can shorten my stroke. So, kind sure of makes a big case. difference, doesn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. man, it's a big difference. Yeah. Now, let's talk about the deadlift. And this is a movement I think people really kind of okay. bypass you on as far as, you know, giving you credit for it. But now, you pull 815 in the last meet, and you missed 845. I mean, do you, do you think that you could eventually get up to being a 900-pound deadlifter? It's one of my it's one of my eventual goals. It, from you know, I've learned from I've learned to deadlift from everybody. You know, I had the privilege of training with Chuck, and um, you know he's a great deadlifter. That guy's pulled eight hundred eight sixteen at two twenty all the way up to seventy five. It's just like uh, he taught me a lot of things that like 
I can't really explain. It's kind of hard to explain, but like I guess what I'm trying to say is, being around those guys, you kind of get a sense of how to how to lift those big numbers. Right. Like Makes sense. Like, sure. Sure. It's like you know, like uh, I was um, who else was there? Like you know, like Matt Smith. He was an 850 puller, and we had like Tim Harrell. He was an 850 puller. It's like you kind of you, after watching these things and you see the exercises you do and you see how they do it, what it takes to do it. You kind of get it in your head. Well, okay, that's all I got to do. Right now, you're you're kind of a you're kind of your deadlift style is sort of reminiscent of a little bit of Eddie Cone because you're not a, a, a what most people would consider to be a wide stance sumo deadlift. You're, you're you're sort of more moderate. Do you feel that you use more of the body parts that are necessary to pull by being in a little bit closer than being out super wide, or do, or does again did this develop? Was it something that you purposely did, or is it something that just the way it, it went? Well, it's kind of like. Um like, you know, we you know, West Side Lube, but like, do ultra wide sumos, so we do ultra wide sumos. And basically, it's kind of funny because when I first started, I didn't I didn't have a deadlift suit. And Lou was like, well, where, where are your squats to to be a deadlift suit? I'm like, all right. So it just kind of just kind of occurred to me. I was like, well, why don't I just put my feet where I squat? You know what I'm saying? So right. you know, if I can squat a thousand, why couldn't I pull? pull, you know, in that same type of position, right, I like, right. might pull a big weight. So that's kind of like my mentality going into it, and I've just kind of perfected it. Right, and, and also with the, with, the, with your squat stance, you really, for west side, you're fairly narrow even even on your squat stance. Did you just feel that that was a more comfortable stance, or did you did you feel you weren't as strong out wide? How, how did that develop, you know, same type of thing? Well, it was kind of funny, because, like, when I first started squatting, I squat super wide, because that's how Chuck squatted and I tried to do everything just like Chuck Bogopo, you know. And then eventually, you know, I started growing. I started getting bigger, and my lever just changed, so I kind of had to, like, move stuff around a little bit and tweak it here and there. But it's just kind of like a process. You kind of, kind of it's like learning yourself, I guess I should say. Right. Now, the thing about your, your – your, I look at your training log all the time, and, and uh, I think, again, I've talked to AJ about this and a couple other guys. The, the, the dynamic benching on the dynamic day, the weights – I think that a lot of people get confused or carried away with what type of weights they need to use because I was I was using 235 with the same type of stimulus as you were, and you were benching 235, and I'm going, well, he benches 900 and I bench 600. How you know I'm doing something wrong here? So t- tell us a little bit about you, you know the, the, the dynamic bench day, the weights that you choose. You know, t- tell us a little about how that comes about. Where where do you think that people should be using? Well, the, you know, what weights they should be using. Well, like, I'll, I'll go back to when I first started at Westside. I remember, like, when I first got there, like, every Sunday was dynamic speed day, 9 o'clock in the morning. And um, we would use bands every Sunday. And sometimes it was like it was like when we first started using bands, I mean, they may have, be have done it. They may have been doing it for, like, a year. But when I got there, it was just every Sunday was bands. And I remember I could, I could barely use a plate. And so, like, it was how it all started was, is I would start at a plate, and then eventually, you know, I would be chasing Freddie Bolt, and he was using 185, and, you know, a year went by, and then I was all hanging with Freddie Bolt, and, and then I was benching what Freddie Bolt was benching, so it was kind of like my dynamic benching in, in, like, line with raw benching, not necessarily my shirted bench. Like, for example, like Brandon Milley, he's my training partner, he, he pretty much hangs with me everything raw, but, but, you know, I can bench almost 150 pounds more than him. Here's a, Brandon lifts about the same as you do raw, and you can do 150 pounds more than him on the bench. And anyway, you guys basically follow the same template, the same type of training. Why do you think that this is? I, I, this has been a question that I've talked to people about, and I talked to Jamie about it just last week. Is that I, I wonder why it is that some people are strong, equally strong as another guy raw, and then they all of a sudden they put the bench on the other guy just kills them. What, do you think that this is a biomechanical thing, a mental thing? What, what do you think that that, that causes something like that? Well, the first thing that comes to my, to my mind is, it, is when you put a bench shirt on, it's like it's like a whole nother world. I'm sure Jamie will tell you this. Like when you put a shirt on and you go to those sevens and you go to those eights, it's like that's a mindset. It's like some people just can't handle the fact that there's that much weight in their hands and that they're about to touch their chest and push it. It's just like... Some people can't take that. Some people think about it too much. Well, it, it's overbearing. I mean, that's, a, that's probably a good good term. To, I mean, it, it's it's you know, it's over. It's a it's a different it's a different animal, like you said. And I think just people, some people can deal with it, and some people can't. Maybe you just can't explain that, Dave. I mean, and, and, and I've and I've talked to a lot of people about this as well. Like I, you know, when I was strong, 
I can actually do a touch and go in the gym with 525. I'd been 605 in the meet. I mean, it, people. In, I remember talking to Bill Crawford about it, and he would say, it's because you're a pussy. It's because you're scared. And, and, and I would go, it must be because I'm going, how can I? There'd be guys in my you gym with men's 365 and men's 200 pounds more in a shirt. 